Hello, this is Noga Halman, creator of Upside Down Parenting, where parenting meets personal growth. My guest today is best-selling author, poet, teacher, and painter, Natalie Goldberg. Natalie and I talk about tapping into the intensity and hardships of our parenting reality as a tool for experiencing well-being and for accessing the essence of being. In this episode, you will get permission to write about your laundry pile instead of folding it. And upon my request, Natalie designed two fun and simple writing exercises, especially for you, designed to wake you up to life and bring you home to yourself when your children are already sleeping or, if you're up to the challenge, as you sit at your kitchen table while your kids are swirling around you. Whether your practice or hobby is singing, baking, knitting, reading, or gardening, the wisdom that Natalie imparts in this conversation from decades of practicing and teaching writing will help you connect your practice with your parenting reality. Born and raised in New York and currently residing in northern New Mexico, Natalie is the author of 11 books, including Writing Down the Bones, which has sold over 1 million copies and has been translated into 14 languages. All images of Natalie's paintings accompanying this recording are the courtesy of Abrams Books, publishers of her latest book, Living Color, Painting and the Bones of Seeing. Hi, Natalie. You know, when I sit down to read or to relax, I usually have a cup of hot tea next to me or some chocolate to nash on. But I've realized over the years, reading your books over and over again, uh, specifically your books, that your books are the candy. I don't eat chocolate, and sometimes I even forget to prepare a cup of hot tea when I read them because I get sucked up and I start devouring them and they're they're just delicious, your books, and I can't get enough of what you have to share. Oh, great. Thank you. Do you read them in uh, Hebrew or in English? No, I read in English. I like to read in the original language that books were written in. Great. And here I have uh, the five books that I'm a proud owner of. I have them right here in front of me. Uh-huh. So uh, I started out with Old Friend from Far Away. That's how I got to know you. And then I also read Writing Down the Bones and The True Secret of Writing and your latest book, uh, Living Color, that I read you like the most of all of your books. Oh, uh, did I say I like that the most? In one of the interviews that uh, I read as I researched, yeah. Well, yeah, they're all my darlings. It's probably <laughs> when it first came out, you know, it needs to be born into the world, so I have to give it extra attention. But mm-hmm. I think they're all my darlings. Um, I, also I have a read, new book yes. coming out in February, so of course that's my favorite book. Your Your newest is always your favorite. Is the new book also about um, painting and writing? No, it's about everything. It's it's um, essays, stories, really, about my life, a life informed by practice and writing. Mm-hmm. So it's backed by that. But it's about me learning to play tennis as a kid, about playing catch with my father, and then being in Japan and going on retreats. It's about everything. Mm-hmm. It's sort of a potpourri. I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it coming out. So, you know, um, my website, Upside Down Parenting, is about transforming our parenting stress and parenting challenges into peace of mind and freeing ourselves through our frustrations and highs and lows as mothers. And I realized that surviving the day, just surviving it, is not enough for me. At some point, even ending the day with saying, oh, this was a good day, I had some control over what was going on, that can't compare with the days in which I say life is good, and my life has a purpose. And this is the experience I have with your writing and with your instructions and teachings and the practice of writing. That's the experience you give me, that our existence is a beautiful, worthy thing with all the pain and despair that is also part of it. And it's when you write about what you said now, like uh, playing tennis with your father. It, it always transcends the playing and the characters in your story. And for me, it connects to how life is beautiful. 
And I'm thinking that it's because your writing is rooted in life itself and in the little nuances of daily living. So I wanted to ask you, how do you explain the power of writing? And what's in it for you still after decades of writing? How does it help you access and feel and change? And how can it do the same for myself and the mothers who are listening to us? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, Well, basically, I come back to practice, keep your hand going. And I do um, uh, 20 minutes, you know, I just go. And instead of looking at a watch, because then you keep cheating a little, I just say, okay, Nat, do two sides of two pages, go. And I let out anything, anything that comes to mind, illogical, angry, happy, whatever. And what you do with that, it flushes it out, and what you get to is the bottom of mind. Not well-being, but the ground of being. And um, so you can see that with taking care of children, I imagine. I don't want to act like any kind of authority. I do not have children. Many, many, many of my students have children. And I think that the writing has helped them survive. And also, you know, as your kids get older, you could do writing practice with them. Go, let's write for 10 minutes and let's try to remember everything that happened today. Mm -hmm. Make a list. Or go, what are my friends with? And it doesn't have to be people. I'm friends with the breeze and the leaves going through it. You know, you can, um, but it really is about, you're right, transforming. In a way, you take your neuroses, all of that. You don't want to get rid of it because it's energy. That energy of neuroses and pain and struggle is also the energy turned over into enlightenment and Mm -hmm. into waking up. So I think that when you physically write and, you know, you put your body into it, really writing is a physical activity. Mm -hmm. And when you put your body into it and you put out everything that comes through you, then, you know, in a way you're transforming or turning what, you know, you can see it in a different way. Some day where you think it was horrible you turn it and you realize something real was there, something mm-hmm. true. And you find that truth when you write. Yes. You have to physically get in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Keep your hand going. In True Secret, um, in the book, The True Secret of Writing, yes. you elaborate on this a lot about writing as a way to be present. Now, I shared with a good friend of mine who likes writing for various purposes that I was about to talk with you. And she raised this question about being present, and I thought it was uh, worthwhile to to present it to you. So this is a mother of uh, a kid who's now 11 years old, a very, very smart kid. And she tells me, and I wrote it in quotation marks, I believe this is the way she said it. She said, I feel like I actually need to leave my life in order to write my morning pages, you know, those three blank pages that you write first thing in the morning. And she says, it's the opposite of being present to my son. I can't write when he's around. And her question was, how do you stay present while needing to escape your presence in order to write? And I believe that you've learned a lot about this dialogue between writing in solitude and being present to the moment and to real life. Yes. At the same time. Yes. Um, well, you can take a break from your child. That practice that you do will allow you to be more present when you're with your child because you'll be more present to yourself. You know, do it while they're sleeping. They, an 11-year-old usually goes to bed earlier than you do. Do it after they go to sleep or they're in school. And um, what that pre- what that does is that writing makes you present to yourself. 
so you can be more present to your child. Don't Mm -hmm. create it as a dichotomy. Either I'm present and separate or I'm with my child and crazy. (laughs) That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, integrate it. Integrate what you get from the writing into the moment with your child. In your experience, does writing really need to be in this uh, solitude and quiet? Because I read in your book that you like to sit in coffee shops and hear the hum around you. Of course, I pick up on the energy. I was going to say, you know, once you get writing practice down, let your son be spinning around in the house and you just write. You know, it's only 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if he starts nagging you, you might give him pen and paper and say, here, why don't you write too? Mommy's writing Mm -hmm. now. So you're modeling something beautiful. You're modeling a practice. Mm -hmm. I really connect with that. You know, I'm a big um, fan of drinking coffee, and I'm, I'm also a promoter of drinking your tea or your coffee while it's still hot as your kids are buzzing around you. And I have seven children, and I live in a really, really small space that most people aren't live, willing to live in this kind of small space with such a large family. And I've learned to sit down in the center of it all and insist on drinking my coffee when the steam is still coming out of it because I feel like this is a practice for me to learn how to be calm when everything is like a hurricane around me. Good for you. That's exactly it. You've got it. Exactly. It isn't, none of it is an emergency. You know, your kids are running around. It's not an emergency. You can drink your coffee. And not only that, that energy, you know, that's why you said, do I go to cafes? Yes, because sometimes at home I just want to go to fall asleep. Whereas Mm -hmm. I go to a cafe, I don't feel alone. And I pick up on the energy around me, and it, you know, invigorates my writing. Mm -hmm. So maybe right in the middle of um, your kids, seven kids running around in a small place, you can write. Mm -hmm. It's your question of what's in front of me right now, right? Yes. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful, yes. I connect to one to to an idea that you mentioned in the in the book Old Friend from Far Away, which is uh, the book on the practice of writing memoir. Yes. There was something so so beautiful in it. I actually think this is what made me want to go and purchase the other books as well. You talk about how life is sideways and writing memoir is sideways. You say that when when I come, let's say I want to write a memoir or I just want to collect my memories in writing. So you say, I don't have to start by telling everyone that I was born in 1974. Instead, I can start from the meal that I ate yesterday because life is sideways and our memory is very sporadic. And I connected with it so much because I feel every day that my my life is completely sideways. A mother's life is sideways. Uh, I wrote to you um, when we when we emailed before that you would think maybe that my day starts with waking up and going to the bathroom to brush my teeth and to do what I need in the bathroom, but it's so not like that. <laughs> <laughs> my kids get to the bathroom before me, and I might get to the bathroom an hour and a half later. Uh-huh. And this is my sideways life. And you give it a lot of legitimacy, and you say, not only that, you don't want to start your book with, I was born in 1940. You want to start it with something that's much more rooted in your life. Exactly. More alive. So you started with... I don't get to the bathroom for an hour and a half after I wake up. That is intriguing, and that's real, and it has real energy because it's coming out of real life. Exactly. How how can we use it, or me or other mothers who want to explore writing, how can can we use this hectic schedule to our advantage when we come and write? Oh, well, just stop right now, pick up the pen, What is running through your mind right now? 
What's right in front of your face? What's happening right now? Mm-hmm. You know, Susie is climbing the honey jar or grabbing <laughs> for the honey jar. What a great opening for a piece. Mm-hmm. Susie is grabbing the honey jar. You know, it's intriguing because you're entering life as it's happening. You're not controlling it or stepping back from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that would be the recommended mindset for a mother who wants to express herself occasionally in oh, writing. yeah. Don't try to be good. Try Be who you are. Mm-hmm. Say what you really think, see, and feel not what you think you should think, see, and feel. We have mm-hmm. so many ideas as mothers about who we should be and how we should be. But the real energy is how it really is. Mm-hmm. And that's where the transformation can happen. Not in a make-believe world or idea. Yeah. I'm thinking now, if I have a plan to write, then I won't go and fold the pile of laundry before I write. Instead, I'm going to write about the the pile of laundry that's in front of me. <laughs> oh, you're terrific. You you really understand. I mean, you I feel like you thoroughly get this. This is Thanks. great. I'm glad you know, <laughs> someone in Israel is really, you know, digesting this work. Well, your work is very real. Thank and you. I think mothers live a very raw life. You yeah. know, it's what it is. Today I had someone come in for an interview. It was an interview for Upside Down Parenting. And uh, I had time exactly to move the table and to create the home stu- studio that we create here for the interviews. And when she came inside, we couldn't even open the door because the the, the cart that we that my husband takes with him to the open market was still next to the door, and there was a huge pile of laundry next to that cart. And between the cart and the pile of laundry, the door wouldn't even open. <laughs> oh. And th- this this is life. This is this is life um, uh-huh. for for me. And I have to accept it. And when I have this backing from you that this is also what writing is made of, it makes me feel very good. Oh, good. Exactly. The acceptance of what is creates a lot of space, you know, rather than trying to make it something else. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Here's a question on the practical side. You mentioned before, you said that we write with our whole body. And I, I read in Writing Down the Bones, which was written, what, 35 years ago? 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so in Writing Down the Bones, you write about writing with a pen and paper. Well, back then, computers weren't so popular and common. And then over the years, I read in your books that uh, people ask you, well, what if we write on the, what if we use the computer? What if, you're u- what if we're used to using the computer? We already are not so so much trained in writing with a pen. So, um your answer changes, but you stick to this idea all along the way that when you write with the body, your mind is connected to your heart, is connected to your hand, yes. right? Um, so, uh, well, it's the I, first yes. way we learned to write physically was with a pen or a pencil. Now, that mm-hmm. is changing. Your children... I'll have to address differently because a lot of them are not learning um, cursive, which Mm -hmm. is too bad because cursive is how you develop the individual. You know, that's why people can do um, handwriting, read it, and tell you about your character because they've Mm -hmm. developed it through cursive. But um, I still think it's important. It's sort of like even though you can drive a car, You can't forget how to walk. You know, Mm -hmm. there might be a time when all your electricity goes out and the computer doesn't work. There should be no excuse not to write. A pencil, a pen, and paper is a very fundamental thing, and I think we should stay connected to it. Now, of course, if you absolutely insist, and it's 
inclined to work on the computer too. Um, it's just a different physical activity. Think about it. One is with one hand, and it's cursive on a page, and you're typing and punching um, letters on a keyboard. Or now people are doing the iPhone. They're just using right. their thumbs, which I'm, I don't know if it's good or bad. It's just different, and a different part of the mind comes out. Mm -hmm. Slightly different, not good or bad, but why not be good at all of them and see what you need for different kinds of writing. Right. I have In a, my experience, yes. I have a student who's a lawyer, and all day he works on a computer. So when he wants to get in touch with his own feelings and with writing practice, he says he just does it with handwriting, and mm -hmm. it's some, it helps him separate from the work day mm -hmm. and acknowledge that some other part of him is coming forward. Yeah. In my experience, it's not even practical sometimes to wait for the for my computer time. Uh, I think my house is a little different than other homes because I actually want my kids to be a little backwards when it comes to technology. I uh -huh. give them cell phones a little later on. Uh, so far, only my 15-year-old has a cell phone, and it's a very, very, I call it a stupid phone, you know. It's so the opposite of a smartphone, what uh -huh. we purchased for her. And we have laptops at home, and they're turned off and put away uh, during the day. So for me, if all of a sudden I have an idea in my head that I want to write down, the most practical thing is to just grab a piece of paper and a pen and to write it down. Sometimes I feel like my mind is scattered all over the house because I have papers here and there waiting for me to collect them with what I wrote on them. Um, exactly. You and have a facility. You know, you don't, you don't think, oh, I have to wait for the computer to be opened. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a flexibility and, you know, you can use whatever you need for writing. Yeah. Just recently I met a friend who was... Um, uh, she was just she she just got up from uh, her shiva on her mother for her mother. Uh -huh. uh, um, shiva is the seven days after. Yes, I know. For for the audience, for for the people oh, who okay, yeah. are not aware. Yeah, so th these are the seven days after a close relative passes away, and she just got up from her shiva. She wasn't home. I met her outside, and she talked with me as if it was a monologue during the shiva. And I realized that my job at that place and time was to just listen, not to comment, just to listen and to nod. And it, her talking came out like a poem. And I knew from your books that I can actually write down her writing, her, her talking in poem lines, in a poem structure. And this was outdoors. I was with my baby. I had a stroller. I had a pen because usually I have a pen with me. And I have some. I had some pieces of paper that are, that were just, uh, you know, they weren't blank papers. But I found a way to write on the margins of the paper, to write what she told me. And I was so grateful that I do not rely on my smartphone or a computer for this because I would have uh, missed the opportunity and forgotten what she had said. Mm -hmm. And it really came out like a poem. I was so happy with this writing. Did you show it to her? Yes, I did. I sent it to her, and she thanked me for giving back to her um, what she said. These oh, were her wonderful. words. Thank you for giving it back to me, for returning it to me. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's really thanks to you, this idea of you can write anything and yeah. you don't have to wait for any like advanced technology for writing. Just exactly. write. Exactly. Exactly. I'm um, really glad. This sounds mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, so I have a friend who actually asked me a question about it. She asked me to ask you. This is a friend also who likes writing for various purposes, not for publishing or anything. And she wanted to know what's the best way to arrange what you write, whether it's a personal journal or following inst instructions in your books, you know, writing short pieces according to your instructions. Should we write in standalone sheets or in a notebook? Should we arrange the the writing thematically or sequentially? So I, for example, completed 15 very thick notebooks 
of uh, inquiry that I did. Inquiry is what you do when um, you answer you answer the questions of the work of Byron Katie. Oh, and yeah. along the way, I wrote a lot of my insights. This was two years of filling up 15, 15 notebooks. And occasionally I feel like going back to the notebooks and opening them and uh, highlighting um, stuff that maybe I can use, you know, to show my kids, to leave for my kids when I'm 120, whatever it is. So for someone like me or like this friend, someone who will most likely never publish um, these writings, is it only about the process uh, of writing or is there a way to make it relevant for children and future generations? And what would be the best way to collect our writings? To write them in a notebook or to do it like in freestanding um, papers? You know, no one has ever asked me this. And I'm a bad one to ask because I'm chaotic in that I have buy cheap notebooks and I just fill <laughs> them. And sometimes I'll start something in one notebook and then I pull it together in another notebook. So I don't have a lot of organization. But I will say that I think it's really important whatever you – but I do think it's good to be in binding notebooks mm-hmm. rather than sheets of paper because then it gets really scattered, number one. And number two, it's too easy to think, oh, I'll throw this out. And you don't want, you want to A piece of paper, all, it's, it's easy to think, yeah? Yes, keep the whole notebook because you want to accept your whole mind. Mm-hmm. It's a practice in accepting when you're boring, when you're angry, you know, just accepting it. So don't, you know, edit it out in your notebooks. Mm -hmm. But then I think it's really good to reread your notebooks because then you get to meet yourself and see what you're really seeing and thinking. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I used to do was the stuff that I really liked when I would reread it, I would type it up. Mm -hmm. I would pull it out. So that's a way of organizing it. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that, you know, I just, seem to vomit it all up in whatever notebook's in front of me. I'm I'm not very organized, and I've been writing for 40 years, so I don't think I'm going to get any better. Mm -hmm. But it it seems to work out. But the key is the willingness to reread your notebook. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about that. You're saying to meet our mind in the notebook. Why is it so scary to Um, meet our mind? Yeah, I... I don't know if it's scary as much as, well, for me, when I first started doing it, what was unbearable was how boring I was. And the other thing that I saw was how much I complain. Ay, ay, ay. I used to complain a lot, and um, I got really bored with reading that. So it actually taught me a lot because when I would start to complain in my writing, I'd put dash. What I really want to say is, and I dropped to a deeper level and Mm -hmm. wrote from there. So um, it's hard to create a relationship with our mind. Um, Why? I don't know why. Maybe we're afraid of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But once you start doing it, it really brings you home to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a very important thing. You know, when you say in your books, write about whatever it is you tell us to write about. Um, my favorite example is write about ice cream. Uh huh. And then you say, 10 minutes, go. I just drop everything and I just, uh, like you say, I shut up and I write. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm not so much afraid to meet my mind anymore. On the contrary, I'm so happy to discover every time that it teaches me a lot about the girl that I was, the girl that's still inside me. And the most surprising thing for me is that after I write something, um, and I'm, I'm saying writing according to your instructions, um, after I write something like that, I feel a lot of compassion for my children. I feel a lot of empathy, and I feel like I, I connect to their experience through reconnecting to my own experience. 
So I'll give you I'll give you a few examples that I wrote down for myself of when it happened, and I really like remember that this connection and bonding happened for me. One is uh, about the ice cream. So my ice cream memories bring me to a very special place in my childhood and to a very happy place in my childhood also, a, a few very happy years. And um, then there was an, an exercise of lift, uh, listing 30 things that made you feel different as a child. And when I listed them, I realized that my kids inherited some of those things from me. And I I really felt for them. They must be feeling different sometimes, just like I did. And that's thanks to that very, very simple exercise. Um, another exercise was to write a six-word long, long memoir. That's one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. And I actually wrote two six-word long memoirs, and I feel that they really covered who I am between the two. One is more about my childhood, and one is more about my adult life. And those 12 words are who I am. Do you want to read them or or recite them? Um, Let me see if they're here. Okay, yeah. So one is, girl grows up in professor's home. Uh And the other one is, 40-year-old and seven kids. Wow. Those are terrific. Between the two, that's uh me. (laughs) That's wonderful. That's great. Can you pick for us uh, an exercise or two that I haven't mentioned mentioned for the mothers who are listening, something that they'll want to just shut up and go right? Oh, okay. Um, well, one, since ice cream was so important for you, how about writing on chicken soup? Seems like a, a, it can be a very rich one. Mm-hmm. You know, tell us about chicken soup. And if your mind wanders and you end up writing about a leather shoe instead, that's okay. <laughs> to begin with chicken soup. And let me think of another. Um... How do you like to play? What ways do you play? That's great. Hmm. That's great. It almost makes me cry. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. Okay, so this is our challenge for our listeners. Um, You know that we have a comment section below the interview, and if anyone wants to share, then that would be uh, really interesting to see what the mothers came up with. Oh, that would be really interesting. It would be great. So, Natalie, I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up. Uh, I usually ask my, uh, my... interviewees, my guests, I ask uh, what is the ultimate purpose of parenting that we should have in mind when we wake up in the morning. But I want to ask you a different question. Okay. So I, when, I researched, uh, when I researched for this interview, then uh, I went online and I saw that you, you've given a lot of interviews and they're mostly on topics like Zen and mindfulness. Um, and books, of course, and bo- your book reviews or reviews of your books, writing as a practice. Um, a lot of it was, of course, in the context of writers, freelance writers, authors who want to learn from you. Um, there was a lot about a course that you've created together with uh, Julia Cameron of The Artist Way. Uh, some interviewers wanted to hear about spirituality and practice and creative writing and I haven't seen anything in the context of parenting but you talk about parenting a lot in these interviews Um, you wrote a book called The Big Failure Uh about your relationship with your father and your Zen teacher 
yeah. and the the disappointment that you had and the feeling of betrayal that you had. And in other places you mention your grandfather and the very warm and calm and relaxing and relaxed relationship that you had with him. Yeah. And you talked about your Zen teacher as a father figure. So the question I want to ask you is, uh, what have you learned about the relationship between children and their parents in the process of writing about all these people in your life? Oh, you are very challenging, but I like it. Um, You know, even as you say it, I realize I've always written from the angle of the child, do you know, because I was the child. Mm -hmm. And being the parent, what have I learned about... Can you ask that last part again? Yeah, what have you learned about the relationship between children and their parents as you were writing your stories about you and your mother, you and your father, your Zen teacher, your grandfather... What I've were learned, they for you? What was the well, relationship? I, I certainly learned that what goes on with your parents is enormous, and it affects you for your whole life. And then you have to really let go in some ways and move on, even when it's good. Like I had a beautiful relationship with my grandfather, but he died. I carry him inside but I also have my own path that opens in front of me, and I have to move on. Mm-hmm. So it, I feel great compassion for parents because I see how much they love their children and how much they mean well even when they really mess up because of who they are and their own incomprehension. Mm-hmm. And um you know, and even when parents I watch when parents are fabulous, the kid still has their own destiny, if that makes any sense. And they and and the you can't make everything happen for them and you mm-hmm. can't protect them from everything. And so I've seen wonderful parenting and I've seen that those kids still have to face their own life. Human life is tough, and they have their own destiny. Mm -hmm. But I think it helps to have the good foundation. But even a hard foundation can be very strengthening. And sometimes you can eat that. You know, just like we said, with um, you have a hard day, and you can turn it over and make it alive. You had a hard childhood. You can turn that over. There's energy there. Mm -hmm. I did not have an easy childhood, and I think some of that has driven me to become a writer and to be who I am now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that helps or not, but it feels like don't worry. Do your best, whether you're the child or the parent. Mm-hmm. Do your best and love as much as you can. Not just each other, but the moment and the sun and the fact that you're alive. Mm-hmm. We won't always be alive. Well, so how did you cope with your disappointment? I think I, um, I think that it gave me a longing to write to share my heart because I didn't get to as a kid Mm -hmm. and to communicate and um, pass my hand through my loneliness and touch other people. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. It's an honor to be talking to you in Israel. It's an honor to talk to you and then also that you're in Israel. Thank you. Thank you.